Just launch away there, David, Dr. David Nyberts. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dennis, and thanks, folks, for joining. Uh, I'll talk for uh, a brief, just a brief amount of time about my work and why I think um, capitalism is uh, is terrible <laughs> for for animals, humans, and everyone in the world. Um, and I guess just to go back, um, uh, just a, a brief uh, look at history, uh, just to look at where capitalism has come from. Um, and I guess I start with the proposition that you're standing on the shoulders of of giants in archaeology and anthropology. Uh, none of what's going on in the world today, all the tragedy and violence and discrimination, and oppression, none of that is human nature. Most of the time we've been on the planet, we evolved as peaceful, egalitarian herbivores. And um, all the oppression that started was basically grounded in uh, a quest for material gain or more broadly, uh, economics. So uh, we can see that really beginning to deform the um, uh, human society about 10,000 years ago, which is relatively recent in human history with the, um, with the start of this practice of agricultural society, uh, which involved um, uh, human uh, capturing, confining, oppressing uh, other animals. And the possession of these other animals, I mean, this was a key source of wealth. So very quickly, powerful men, armed men surrounded by uh, warriors and then armies, they began to expropriate and claim for themselves uh, the other animals as property. And within these early agricultural societies, we see the oppression of other animals going hand in hand with the development of hierarchies in society in which you've got a small group of powerful elites and their uh, religious leaders who are who are standing next to them, and then the masses of people uh, be, being relegated to the status of peasant, serf, and slave. Uh, but and then it becomes most destructive with the emergence of what I've written about uh, somewhat extensively: uh, nomadic pastoralists. So nomadic pastoralists they just accumulated enormous numbers of other animals, and this is all happening in Eurasia at the time, and they become very violent, militaristic, uh, and the terrible oppression of other animals, this uh, enables them to become marauders and invaders, but uh, possessing all these other animals also makes it necessary for them to launch these deadly uh, invasions across Eurasia that went on for thousands of years because they needed uh, fresh water and grasslands, you know, for growing thousands of other animals that, that they were possessing. So here we see the oppression of other animals as instruments of war and as rations and as labors. Their oppression now is deeply entangled with the masses of people in Eurasia who are facing a deadly invasion by these huge militaristic armies that are invading them uh, taking whatever, whatever captive animals they have, killing people and enslaving people. And the more land they take, uh, uh, more animals they take, the larger their societies, then the more invasions they need to do. So this is an early example of entangled oppression. What was happening to other animals was, was deeply entangled to the, um, to the oppression, violence uh, experienced by you know, people throughout Eurasia. And to compound this, when you crowd all these other animals together, then as in now, you're going to promote disease. So the number of diseases develop when these other animals, cows, sheep, horses, camels, pigs, when they're crowded together, obviously you're going to see the um, emergence of some very deadly um, diseases. And some of these diseases jump species uh, to the humans, uh, to humans, and one of the most deadly of those zoonotic diseases was smallpox. So, I guess the terrible oppression of these other animals for material gain um, was terrible for the other animals, and it was terrible, uh, you know, for the uh, you know, for the masses of people in Eurasia. Uh, and, and this really is it's deformed uh, the um, uh, human societies going forward that became militaristic. Um, uh, led by toxic masculine men, 
in which the men who rose to the top in armies and in leadership were the most vicious um, in demonstrating their violence and and um, and uh, their tenacity in, in killing other people. So, so this was human society in the in the other part of the world, unfortunately, in your part of the world, uh, that went on for centuries. And then, of course, this whole system uh, with the collapse of Rome, when Rome was eventually another predacious society, they were eventually overcome by environmental problems linked to the ranching of so many other animals. Plus, you know, they were overtaken by people like uh, Attila the Hun. Then the, the, the Middle Ages becomes the same predacious, stratified a system, and uh, just jumping to the um, to later in the Middle Ages, uh, we see uh, the enclosure movement happening. So all of this oppression is happening because it's producing wealth, but but this is a systemic problem, is in that those who are doing the oppression they have to control, uh, they have to control, and as societies become a bit more complex and they develop states than those doing the oppression, they have to, to control the power of the state. So we see in later Middle Ages with the emergence of parliament that you know, the elites can basically um, uh, control parliament and push them to enact in the enclosure movements, which are pushing so many people off the land, you know, forcing them into cities where they're going to be exploited as early forms of the proletariat. And then those lands are now flooded with, uh, with other animals, uh, cows, horses, and especially sheep, whose hair is, is very valuable. So this is an example, another form of entanglement, what's happening to humans and other animals. And in this particular case, this is political entanglement, that this is the state, uh, state policies that are enabling the expansion of all this oppression of other animals uh, at the expense of the uh, expropriation of land and displacement of masses of people throughout Europe. And, uh, and then, of course, Ireland. And I don't, you folks are probably can talk about this much more at length than, than what I can. But um, anyway, so why did, uh, why did Britain invade Ireland? Well, for material gain and for wealth. And of course, a lot of Irish land was valuable because it could be used for ranching for cows and sheep. Um, and of course, that had devastating consequences for people in Ireland. And of course, uh, the, the effects of that, you know, are, are linger to this day, but of course this contributed to the potato famine because Irish were just had tiny plots of land left to them by the British invaders. And when a potato crop failed, then it launched into uh, starvation and disease and a lot of immigration. Um, so that's it, that happened because it produced wealth. It was the power of the state, you know, the British government that that promoted the expansion of ranching and promoted. The, uh, the oppression of people in Ireland. And, and then what come, also what comes into view uh, is ideological entanglement. So for oppression to occur is motivated by material gain, always has been, uh, but those who, uh, who, who are able to pursue that oppression systematically in industries, everything from vivisection to agribusiness, you know, they have to control the state. And the, but then they also need to normalize naturalize, uh, routinize that oppression. So that's ideological control. So in the case of the British invasion of Ireland, one of the ways that the British um, uh, justified you know, that, that brutal invasion was by comparing um, people in Ireland to other animals, especially primates. You know, so this is an example of animalization has been talked about by numerous scholars um, everybody from Corey Wren to John Sorensen and uh, Aff and Phil Coe. But this is a powerful form of, um, of ideological control and that uh, it's used to justify and defend the horrific treatment of other people like we see going on right now in Gaza and the occupied West Bank. But also, of course, this is devastating for other animals because as long as it basically cements their status as these uh, beings uh, who have no right to exist and basically uh, they have no worth at all uh, and no characteristics you know that are worthy of of any mention it just cements their their um, their disparagement and devaluation and it, so this this wealth motivated 
uh, invasion of Ireland, uh, you backed by the state and justified through ide ideological control, was basically you know, launched to the rest of the world, um, uh, launched to the Americas, um, and again, uh, at, at the time, uh, you're ranching, you know, still to this day to a considerable extent, ranching in agribusiness, but a lot of the land and, and invasion that, that went on in not just the Americas, but uh, in throughout part, many parts of Africa, Australia, New Zealand, for example, of land was taken for ranching. Um, so the more land, the more uh, the more genocide and people that could kill, the more lands could be taken, you know, for ranching, the more profits that could be had. And, and for, for decades, you know, the skin of cows, for example, and a hair of sheep, you know, were valuable commodities, uh, and you're know, pouring back into Europe. So, um, uh, and, and so this allows an opportunity for a thought experiment. You know, I might ask back, say in the 15th century when the uh, Europeans were invading the Americas, would animal rights have been in the interest of humans? And I would say yes, because if, if the Europeans thought that animal had rights not to be exploited or oppressed, they would have been <laughs> invading and taking all of that land from indigenous peoples using that for ranching. And then we could also ask, uh, would human rights have been in the interest of in the interest of other animals? And then the answer is absolutely yes, because if, if the Europeans thought that the indigenous peoples and peoples throughout the world, peoples in their societies had certain rights to dignity um, and, and not to be oppressed, then uh, they would have been taking the land that was, that was then filled with, all, with growing numbers of, of, uh, of other animals oppressed at, at, at astounding numbers. So, and importantly, and I, I go through this history just to say that it's all this materially oriented, economically motivated oppression backed by the power of states and justified through nefarious forms of, of um, ideological control, animal, animalization, racism, sexism, classism. This all is morphing now into the capitalist system. And importantly, capitalism is not the system that just kind of emerged it was created by some moral philosophers in Scotland or someplace, and all of a sudden, <laughs> um, now here is this break with the past. There's no break with the past. Capitalism is basically the same system. It's basically, it's a more nuanced but complex system of the predacious, violent quest for wealth. So this is where capitalism came from. All of this horrible history that has formed uh, the, um, you know, the the nature of human societies since um, you know, over the past 10,000 years. So, you know, coming to the United States, just to jump forward, I mean, so much violence and genocide and dispossession to, of indigenous peoples here happened because so much of their land was taken for ranching. Where I am right now in the university that I'm at is on stolen land. One of the first uh, military marches of the uh, New, newly formed U.S. government was you know, dis they were dispatched to Ohio Territory to uh, to kill and displace indigenous peoples, and then they killed as many free living other animals as they could, bears, cougars, uh, uh, and then then they flood the areas with cows and pigs and sheep because it's profitable, uh, and then they keep pushing indigenous peoples west, and ranchers you know, and ranchers are right there taking the land as, as soon as the indigenous peoples are forced off. And then U.S. provokes a war with, with Mexico. Uh, again, this is a capitalism, you know, uh, more opportunities for profits and expansion. U.S. provokes a war with Mexico, a deadly, terrible war, um, uh, uh, takes over half of Mexican territory. And then a lot of that land is also um, flooded with cows after they nearly exterminate uh, the buffalo and free living other animals. And it, and the surviving indigenous peoples are relegated to uh, land that, that they think is relatively worthless. Um, and, and this morphs then over time to this growing, not just in the United States, but other countries too, this destructive uh, agribusiness industry, vivisection industry, entertainment industries, all of these are motivated by material gain. So, um, uh, and then just to come back to war for a minute, uh, uh, capitalism, uh, U.S. capitalists, they, they, they develop a surplus and, and they, they need to keep expanding their opportunities for wealth. So the uh, so, so United States joins so Europe in becoming 
colonialist and imperialist. And the U.S., for example, declares the whole Western Hemisphere, you know, under their control, basically their garden. And then the U.S. begins, you know, waging uh, wars, um, you know, throughout uh, Latin America, um, you know, for uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that um, people in Latin America, for example, and other parts of the world, we could go into detail on that, but they've had enough of capitalism and they want to form some type of different system. And they try to elect leaders that represent their interests. Uh, and those leaders want to use the resources there and the land there for their people, for their development, um, so that they can have decent lives. But that gets in the way of U.S. capitalists and their profit. So as you, everyone here probably knows, uh, the U.S. will covertly or uh, overtly, using the CIA or using the U.S. military, they will they will undermine, assassinate leaders, they'll, they'll undermine governments if necessary, they will invade so that they can put um, leaders in power, they keep their doors open uh, to the capitalists in the United States and other capitalist countries, and the interests of their people, you know, are, are put in the basement so that people just serve as, as fodder for profit as it's their land and resources. So this is important. I'll come back to this in a minute. But this creates a great deal of deprivation and insecurity for people around the world. Um, so that people in the United States... It, are also their fodder for capitalist profits. Um, so, so the state, there's, there's a way that the state controls and basically the capitalists can control people here. Uh, they, they control state power. You know, the capitalists absolutely control uh, the United States government and, and we have it like a sham fake democracy uh, in which people vote for the lesser of, of two horrible evils. Uh, the capitalists control the media. The capitalists can basically control the educational system, religious system. And of course, all of these systems are promoting all and, and guaranteeing and protecting all forms of animal oppression, not the least of which is agribusiness as it you know, continues to grow um, horribly. Um, and then globally, what the capitalists have done by the, by the 21st century is the, the colonized world um, has become, you know, people here are misled by the educational system, thinking a lot of countries around the world are simply undeveloped. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, as, as you all know, they've been purposefully under, underdeveloped and the colonial rampaging has laid the foundation for the, um, you know, for the, the, for the, uh, for the, the structure of the 21st century. So, you know, all of these nations is referred to every, from the, as the third world or the global south, or I think more respectfully, the majority nations of the world, th these these countries have been you know, plagued by uh, having their their systems undermined and then controlled externally by powerful countries that, that keep their people um, exploitable, that get the resources out cheap, and then they they're able to dispatch their surplus goods there. Um, so so this is important because not only do we see capitalism promoting all of these horrific forms of animal oppression, not the least of which is agribusiness um, and treating other animals as food. And that has continued to grow uh, over, the, you know, over the next decades, it's just gonna get worse. Um, and then of course, and that's creating all kinds of problems. And again, and this is an example of, of the, the denial of, of animal rights, you're denying human rights, because when all of this land that was taken during colonization and it continues to be hold, held Either for feed crop production or for ranching, then we've got uh, we've got a billion hungry people around the world, you know, hungry because they, they've lost access to land. Um, we've got um, people around the world because we're crowding all these other animals together. You know, we've got uh, people facing pandemics, and probably the next deadly pandemic is going to be some form of influenza coming from these growing numbers of factory farms. We've got the depletion of the world's fresh water supply. So many regions of the world are going without fresh water, um, using disproportionately you know, to, to um, raise other animals you know, who will be oppressed for food. Most of water pollution is caused by um, raising other animals for food. And then, of course, the climate crisis itself. You know, the climate crisis, uh, some have argued that raising other animals for food is a primary, if not the leading cause of the climate crisis that's devastating for everyone. It's, dev it's, it's all of this um, horrible oppression of other animals by the billions it, as the climate changes. This is leading to massive die-offs of the 
of, of many inhabitants of the world, and it's creating unlivable conditions uh, for, for many people around the world. So we're just now aspiring toward a future, it's not, it's, well, we're already a, a reality and, and an increasingly desperate future in which people are going to be so insecure and so deprived that um, they don't have time to think about animal rights. You know, they're just thinking about how are they going to survive day to day. And when people are, are insecure and trying to survive, I mean, many will, will do what they need to do and eat who they need to eat in order to survive. And, and right here where I live in Ohio, I see people who's got a couple acres of land in order to help them pay their mortgage or uh, pay their insurance. You know, they're, they're ranching some sheep or a couple of cows and then running those down to the slaughterhouse to get what they can to help them pay their bills. Uh, I think if they had an alternative to that, uh, they would probably take it. But, I, but my point is, as I wind up here, is that capitalism is terrible. Capitalism is terrible for other animals. What is happening to other animals is deeply entangled with human oppression economically, politically, ideologically. Um, and as we struggle you know, to try to um, reduce, if not over time, abolish this horrific oppression of other animals, we have to realize that that oppression is deeply entangled with all this horrific oppression of members of our own species and that it is the capitalist system that is behind this worldwide. It is the people on Wall Street and the, and the, and the bankers and, um, and the Fortune 500 companies. I mean, they are just looking, they'll invest in anything that they think is going to bring a return, whether it's investing in more factory farms in China, um, uh, if, they, if they're investing in arms. And of course, uh, the arms, you know, and all these people experience violence. And right now, all the deadly destruction and in Russia and Ukraine, and especially in Gaza and the West Bank. I mean, who has time to think about other animals? I mean, desperate people, uh, you know, like I say, they'll do whatever they need to survive. And the capitalists are sitting back and they're making money off the, off the weapons and they're making money off the expansion of agribusiness and a vivisection. Um, and I think they would just uh, maybe plan to, to retire to their yachts you know, as, as the world sinks into the abyss. So, so anyway, I would say that socialism is a direct is what we need to to think about. Um, so I, I think it's absolutely uh, for anyone to think that we're going to abolish oppression, especially animal oppression under the capitalist system. I mean, it, it's just it can't happen. Cap, capitalism and material gain has driven this you know, for thousands of years, and now it's just um, it, we're, we're running to the um, environmental abyss. Um, uh, so capitalism behind it and socialism would create a window. Socialism would create a window because if the capitalists are controlling the state and the media and the educational institutions and keeping people insecure and deprived, socialism moving toward more economic democracy, political democracy, um, a more democratic educational system. Uh, so and, and developing a system so that people are not so insecure and experiencing deprivations and worrying about how they're gonna make this payment and that payment, that provides then the opportunity to start challenging all forms of oppression, especially animal oppression in a much more effective way. Thanks. Okay, I'm ready for questions. <laughs> do I call on people, Dennis, or do you do that? Um, not sure where Dennis is. Maybe, maybe um, I can jump in and ask the first one, perhaps, David. Thank you very sure. much for your presentation. I'd, I'd like to uh, try to bring two ideas together, if I may, or even if I can. Uh, the first is, if we think about something like 1992, Kathleen Janaway of first the Vegan Society and then Movement for Compassionate Living said that um, a vegan mindset, a vegan set of values, would obviously liberate other animals, but it would also work towards ending human warfare and things like poverty. What she was getting at was that um, vegan values and capitalist values don't marry together. They don't fit very well. Mm -hmm. But the the pushback against that, and I, I would adopt that position as well, and you do, I think, I think what's been characterized as the biggest threat to your position, David, is... Um, this idea that no matter what system or mode of production, you're going to have 
the exploitation of other animals. So why would we pick out capitalism as particularly bad or worse? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, it's a great question. So this is good. Um, so some some detractors will say, look, you know, there was animal oppression before capitalism. <laughs> yeah, I've just talked about that. It was motivated by economic gain. And that whole system then became that whole system of economic exploitation and violence and predation that simply morphed in, into the more nuanced capitalist system. So there's no real break there. So 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 the oppression of other animals is motivated by economic gain. So so there has been attempts at a socialist system, at creating some social systems around the world, um, uh, but uh, but there, there's been a problem. If when the socialist systems tried to emerge, say just for example here in Cuba, um, you know the United States. I mean they they just they just want to destroy it. So the United States you know, they they threaten and and they have these uh, severe embargoes and they just try to strangle the people in Cuba economically. Um, and amongst other things, um, people in Cuba have adjusted to that in part by developing you know organic food systems, um, but. I, I think it's, it's going to be a hard sell for a socialist leader when a society is struggling under that sort of deprivation. It's going to be a hard sell to say, OK, now we need to think about you know, getting meat and dairy and eggs out of our diet, you know, when they're already suffering such, uh, uh, such deprivations. And when you've got uh, society, socialist societies like you know, Russia, when they first had the revolution and they were just then they were attacked immediately by, by militaries and then by capital states to try to take them down and then and then they had to face the Cold War where their resources disproportionately had to go into militarism. And these toxic masculine men, you know, arose as the defenders of, of the Soviet Union. Um, that's those are not the conditions you know, by which you, you can develop uh, uh, economic security. You can develop democracy um, and you can begin to educate people and you, you can begin then to challenge everything from racism to speciesism. So I think it's possible under socialism because under socialism, there wouldn't be what's plagued us up to this moment is the economic gain, the wealth that can be obtained uh, through all these different forms of oppression. Thanks for that, David. Sure. You might go next since I've got my hand up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. I, I'm not sure. Um, uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. OK. Can you tell us a little bit more what you mean by socialism? Is it sort of limited to the kind of thing you had in Bolshevik Russia and Castro's Cuba? Or is there something a bit more to it than that? Yeah, yeah, but that's a good question. I guess that could be... <laughs> a, a, uh, a whole other presentation, but I, I guess at, at a basic extent, yeah, you know, I actually think that that the idea of communism, I think the idea of communism in in its in its theoretical form, I mean that takes us back to how we existed on the planet. Most of the time, we'd walk the earth. It was communal, people looking out for each other, people helping each other. There was no quest for profit. There was no there was no violence. There was no stratification. So I think that's a beautiful idea, but socialism. Uh, if we, I, I'm not sure if we can, if we're able to, to, to make our way to that, to, to go back to where we, we started, where we ought to be. But socialism would be a system in which we did, in which it would be economic democracy. So minimally, it would mean that people would have a huge say in uh, the economic uh, decisions that affect them, the economic decisions at the workplace uh, that, that include, include their pay, that include the, the harms that are being created by their companies or their businesses, and they could begin to step in and challenge that, and and, and so and, and create a more uh, sustainable environment, working conditions for people. I think that would be wonderful for everybody. I, I think under socialism, if we could get you know, the wealthy and the capitalists you know out from their control of the state, you know, they basically have control of the state from the beginning. Then we could have true democracy. Then we could see people's interests also represented on, on domestic policies and foreign policies. You know, right here in the United States, for example, the majority of people want to see a ceasefire in Gaza. 
but it doesn't mean anything. The majority of people here want to see universal health care for everybody. That doesn't mean anything, right? So there's no real political democracy. They'll let people vote on things that, uh, that will divide people. And of course, and this is one of the ways that the capitalists maintain you know, all this uh, horrific oppression is, is they'll do it through racism. They'll do it through sexism. They'll do it through xenophobia. And that's, <laughs> that is not just alive and well. I mean, that is terrible right here in the United States. And, and this is in many ways, you know, the, uh, this is the bedrock you know, of Trump's popularity, you know, how he is able to, um, uh, to, to play upon these nefarious ideologies, racism, sexism, classism, speciesism, um, you know, they tend to be, people are socialized into that. So you, so people's the prejudice against other animals and their prejudice against um, devalued peoples, I mean, they're taught this, right? There's nothing about this is human nature. So if we had a democratic political system and the people's interests were really represented, and then we had an educational system that we could get the companies out and here in the United States, we could get the Cattlemen's Association out of the classroom and the dairy industry out of the classroom and the vivisections out of the classroom. And then we could then begin talking about, you know, programs like what, uh, you know, Roger, I think Roger went into classrooms and still does perhaps, but, you know, to be, to begin really educating people about the other inhabitants of the planet and about how um, everyone, all the inhabitants of the earth develop respect and deserve respect and dignity. Um, uh, so I think socialism, a more socialist educational system that represents, you know, uh, the people um, and political system, economic system, and then your know, religious ideology. I mean, religion is is a uh, religion in the United States was basically captured by capitalists in the early 20th century when they were being criticized for all the deprivation uh, around the Great Depression that they began, you know, subsidizing funding. Uh, religious leaders that's culminated in, into the ultra-right wing evangelical Christian movement in the United States. Th that is also, it, it distracts people. So I, I think if we could simply move to a society that has more economic democracy, political democracy, educational democracy, making sure that people have their basic needs met, no one goes hungry, everyone has right to education, everyone has a right to decent affordable housing, jobs, income, then I think we begin to lay the conditions, you know, for that we can start to undo that deformation that started 10,000 years ago. So anyway, generally speaking, um, you know, that's my idea of where we should be going that I call socialism. Uh, Doctor, a great talk. Are there any, uh, any other authors you could recommend similar to the books that you've written yourself? Oh, um, so um, a good friend of mine, Corey Wren, who I think is, uh, she's in England now, I think at um, uh, Kent University, University of Kent or Kent University, I'm sorry, Corey. Yeah, she wrote a book uh, about, um, uh, about uh, animal oppression in Ireland. I can't remember the, the name of that book, but her name is Corey Wren, W-R-E-N-N, -N, has written a, a great book. We had um, we had her on here, David. Oh, you did! Oh, that's terrific. Oh, I we did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, last year, sometime I can't exactly remember the month. And yes, she did talk. She was very knowledgeable about Ireland. She stayed here for about two years, maybe for education or time out to write. I forget which, but she was very knowledgeable, and she gave us a great grounding on what Ireland was like pre-colonial times. So we we got a lot of uh, this this blank social uh, history was filled in for us and she did the uh, the webinar was entitled so um uh, veganism in ireland or um you know um uh, plant-based ireland and she gave us a lot of names of different people through the 20th century who were um animal activists or um vegan activists so yeah she was brilliant we really enjoyed her so thanks thanks for that one that's a nice connection Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, there's also um, uh, John Sorensen in Canada, you know, who's written a, a, a couple of great books and a couple uh, anthologies in critical animal studies. Uh, there's a there's so many. There's a, a great um, uh, critical animal study uh, a study scholar in Spain, Nuria Almiron, and uh, uh, she is um, uh, has written a couple of books and a couple of great anthologies. And I think she's working on one right now. Kind of a um, 
it, it looks like an amazing uh, historical look at vivisection. Um, and then, you know, Roger Yates, Roger Yates, I think his dissertation is outstanding and you can access that online. <laughs> I, I strongly encourage that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Caroline. Hi, Caroline. Hi. Hi, David. Um, hi. Hi. So my question is, um, in modern day capitalist societies, the general public's empathy and concern for our fellow animals is often diverted and redirected away from veganism and the abolition of animal exploitation, and instead is directed towards the regulation of continued exploitation, so-called welfare reforms. Do you see this as being made worse by the fact that we're in a capitalist society now? Uh, yes, uh, mm -hmm. I, I do see that you know, for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, first of all, it, it, again, it is a distraction and it makes if people if people think, well, it's OK for me to go to McDonald's because McDonald's has given this award you know, to this to this egg producer because they've been they've been they've increased uh, the, the cage that they imprison chickens. I, I think it gives it, it gives this false sense of, of progress and people who may who, who are breaking out of their anthropocentric speciesist socialization and, and they begin to recognize that you know there's something really wrong going on here. I think that makes it easier for them, you know, not to um, to basically continue uh, their oppressive consumption habits, for example, um, without feeling too bad about it. Um, I, I think it presents a lot of these so-called reforms. Of course, industry are right in the mix of it. And if they allow a lot of these things to go through, in many ways, I think it, it benefits their interests. I mean, they can see how they're, they, they can, if they maybe treat animals a little bit better, give them a little more space, uh, that um, uh, this can in increase productivity. So, uh, so I, I think, uh, um, and, and, then, and then at the same time, and then they're given awards for that. Um, uh, but then I, I think that you know, there's also, you know, the capitalists you know, will take advantage of, of, you know, people's growing concern. And now, you know, you can find marketed, you, know, you here's humanely raised eggs right here. And you've got, and you've got humanely raised flesh here and, and free range that. And so, so, you know, they're making money on, you know, people's concern for other animals. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, um, and again, then, of course, I, I think they're pandering more to people who are somewhat more fluent because for the more educated people who should know better and could basically, you know, educate themselves and start learning um, but while they go and spend more money for these more higher priced so-called um, humanely raised uh, products from oppressed other animals. You know, the vast majority, 95 percent of people who are struggling, you know, they're going to buy the cheapest fare uh, that... Um, that agribusiness can produce. So, if the more elite and educated aren't willing aren't willing to make that change, and they're, so they're basically co-opted by the by this reform movement that basically keeps them, you know, from making the step that needs to be needs to be taken. Um, and then, uh, just a, a footnote, coming back to environmental destruction and devastation. Of course, in the United States, a lot of what's promoted as free-range beef uh, or, or cow flesh. It, it, uh, it's, it's coming from uh, South America and you know, like the Amazon, you know, where you know, people are being displaced and rainforest is being destroyed. You're facilitating uh, human oppression and climate change. Um, uh, and then there's the cows are horribly oppressed and then their flesh is sent to the United States. And people think you know, that they're contributing <laughs> to, to the environment, to animal uh, protection somehow. Yeah. So it's it's a, it's just a horrible misstep. But it, unfortunately, You've got some some animal rights groups. They stay away from any critique of capitalism. They'll promote these reforms, sometimes working hand in hand with with the industry itself, and it allows those organizations to stay up and running. Um, and so you know, they've they've not just lost sight of their purpose, you know, but they're they're setting us back. Mm -hmm. that, so. and, and so, do you think that moving away from the capitalist system would help to reduce the the power of, of welfareist ideology? I do, because 
because all of the oppression of humans and other animals is deeply entangled, it's promoted by material gain. And if we can begin to develop economies, uh, economic democracy, in which we're producing for need as opposed to for profit, then I think um, uh, people are people will, won't just be educated. They'll be educated about what's happening to other animals. They'll be educated. I think this is very important. Educated about their own physiology, and and these the things that they've been um, uh, conditioned and encouraged, exhorted to, to put into their put into their bodies that this is so harmful to them. So I think under a socialist system, you know, when you take away that uh, that that profit motive, um, and you can begin to provide more for people's benefit. Uh, I, I think they're going to see right through that welfare sham. Thanks. Sure. Hi, um, uh, Wendy. Wendy McGowan. Hi, Wendy. Hi there. Hi there, hi. everyone. Um, hi, David. Good to see hi. you and every and everyone on here as well. Um, there might be a bit of an overlap with what you were just saying to Carolyn, actually, but um, I've got a two pronged question, if that's all right. I'm going to be a little bit cheeky. Um, so firstly, um, if, if we're going to be more equal in society, people have to move away from this um, kind of desire for wanting more and more and always striving to, to make more, have more, consume more. Um, and so people are going to have to actually start living more simply and consume less. And I, my question to you is, do you, do you think that as humans, you know, and we look around and, and see the world as it is, do you think that humans are capable of relinquishing their privilege and entitlement? Because that's what we're actually going to have to actually ask people to do. Um, and obviously there are going to be you know, psychological elements to that as well. Um, and then the second part of my question is, how can we, excuse me, how can we as animal advocates make a difference? Um, so eco-feminists eco would encourage community-based local activism through an intersectional perspective. And so um, would you agree with that or do you have anything to kind of suggest or, or build on from that? Yeah, so yeah, to go back to your first question, um, we, our species, we don't have ancestral memory, we don't have instincts. So this, so this uh, insatiable appetite for more, and, and this phone and these jeans and those shoes, this is this is all a social construction. Uh, here in the United States, you know, uh, at the youngest age, you know, children are just they're just socialized and programmed that part of their very sense of self is connected not to being an engaged citizen, but, but, but being a consumer. And their sense of self, they see through the eyes of other people who look at them and what shoes are they wearing and, and, you know, and what kind of phone do they have? So this is all social construction. And in, in, in the US, people are rewar they're rewarded for that. I mean, so they say, wow, look at you and look at that phone, wow. And so, so that's all a creation. So if we could begin a transition so that people are rewarded not for becoming one of the wealthiest people in the world, but rewarded, you know, for uh, acts of kindness and compassion and standing up against injustice and standing up against those who are oppressed. We be begin to recognize that and reward it. And we begin to reward people uh, for who's, who's the person with the least environmental footprint or who has lowered their environmental footprint. And then we can begin to give, I mean, this is what their sense of self begins to be based on, certainly we can make that transition. You know, it just needs to change change the, the culture and the structure of the society that's just promoting you know, all the, the harms and, and the condition that you know, when people, that's all they see, they think this is just the way it is. This is natural. This is human nature. We can't overcome this. But, but, this is, but human nature is it's like a piece of silly putty, right? Any, right? We could take the next generation and we could raise them in a socialist system and then look them up in 20 years and they would be thinking, functioning in a much different way than what they would be if they were here, if that makes any sense. But I, but, but I think it's doable. But, but the capitalists, I mean, they're just keeping a grip on this, right? So this is why they're engaged, they control the state and they control the media. 
And, and uh, by the way, the mass media, I mean, when people go to movies, they think they're watching a movie, but, but there's all kinds of ideological messages and species as messages and, and gendered messages and, and all these movies about warfare and violence. In the United States, you've got the CIA and Pentagon, you know, standing on, you know, on the other side of the camera, you're giving cues and, and support. Uh, you know, making sure that that constant, the American ideology that's created is one that tends to represent the status quo. Yeah, I, I, I think ecofeminists are absolutely wonderful. And I think, yeah, getting at grassroots and building, I think that's imperative. I, um, uh, I, I think, uh, and I guess one of my biggest messages is um, uh, just, uh, just to reflect that when I was um, at a when John Sorensen, who organized these great conferences at Brock uh, University um, in, in Canada, and I attended one of these, and I, I stood up years ago and I made this connection between animal oppression and capitalism. And, and one man got up after I finished, finished speaking. He was very upset and frustrated. And he says, it's not enough that we have to take on animal oppression. Now we have to take on capitalism too. Um, but, but the truth is, that's the road. Right. That is that that is the path that we need to go. So so for any grassroots group critique, you got to critique the suppression of other animals and you have to have to connect the dots, how um, animal rights and human rights, you know, go hand in hand and you won't develop one without the other. And and importantly, is the capitalist system. Right. We have to continue whenever possible. Any opportunities join the ranks with all those who are organizing, agitating, you know, against the capitalist system, whether they're new political movements, that people trying to establish alternative economic models, co-ops, worker, you know, we need to do everything we can, you know, to, to let people, so that people, it's clear to people, capitalism is destructive and it's, it's killing everybody. So we have to begin to work that into our day-to-day -day work, I think. Thanks for that, David. I've got like a million more questions now, but I'm going to uh, I'm going to shut up unless someone else asks you. Oh, you can email them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I will. Thank you. Uh, Gertrude uh, Kazu. I'm not sure about the pronunciation. Gertrude. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome. Okay. I'm I'm here, Troy. I'm from Belgium. Um, so I have a more practical question. Uh, let me first say that I'm um, really yeah. Um, I've read a lot of your books. Uh, and I'm really was inspired by them. So um, very. I'm a, I'm a big fan of yours too. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's more a practical question that I have. Um, so do you think we need to come to the socialist democratic system? Do you think we need to achieve that more by incremental ch changes in the system itself? So trying to change the system within itself like uh, through education, but doesn't that run the risk of being swallowed up by the capitalist system again? Or do you think we need more revolutionary steps or separate societies like, uh, I think it was Carolyn who talked about the ecofeminist communities that then perhaps live separately from capitalist society and try to change capital the capitalist system that way? Uh, the more practical side of it, uh, uh, what what advice do you have for for advocates for activists? Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the advice of everybody here is probably just as good as mine. But I but I would embrace everything that you said. I I, I think those of us in societies that that even have a fake democracy, there are some opportunities to work within that system for change. And I think we need to grasp each of those opportunities. Obviously the state has been structured against the interests of, of the masses, you know, from the beginning and remains, but in some societies that try to promote themselves as democracies and try to maintain that facade, that does create some opportunities, you know, to, um, to create a new, uh, you know, political uh, parties to, to, mo to promote, to uh, promote, um, your political movements. I think in the academy, um, uh, I, for, from some, uh, one of my favorite quotes is from John Steinbeck's book, uh, The Grapes of Wrath, um, uh, if anybody's familiar, but uh, when they're all ready to climb on the old truck and make their way to California because they've lost their, their farm to the bankers and they're going out to try to find jobs as migrant, migrant workers and and they all pile on the truck and all their belongings and 
and the suspension of the truck begins to give and the key character john and Tom Jody squats down next to the preacher and says, Preacher, you think we'll make it? And the preacher says, John, if you do, it'll be a miracle straight from Scripture. Well, the fact that I was tenured and promoted, being the most radical person on campus, it was a, mir- it was a miracle straight from Scripture. But, but I, I guess, uh, of course, that was 25 years ago. But I'm seeing like all of these young especially young, young and old, but in, increasingly these young scholars, you know, the uni- uh, university uh, training and, and doctoral degrees and, and presenting at conferences. And I'm thinking this is terrific. And, and the papers and the, um, you yeah, so we've got organizations from, you know, critical animal studies um, in Europe and, and around the world that, but increasingly, you know, some of these voices are, are getting into universities, just like in Nuria Al- Almiron in Spain, has been a critical animal studies scholar, and she was just recently promoted to full professor in Spain, I guess, which is not an easy task to achieve. So I think we pursue that, but then, but then we also critique the university, you know, when they're, when they're involved in justifying uh, the, uh, the the forms of exploitation and oppression that they may be involved with. So I I guess we embrace it all. And I I think uh, it is great to have, you know, revolutionary cutting edge movements that's just out there, you know, every day, critiquing and protesting. I, I think those work, work hand in hand, um, you know, with the uh, with the new political parties trying to push within the system. I think we need it all. But importantly, I think if we can get start to get people much more connected, if we could connect the people on the left, and especially those people pushing for anti-capitalism and get them more connected and aware of how all the issues that they're working for, practically every issue is related you know, to forms of animal oppression, um, I, I think we, we could develop into a much more, um, uh, a much more, we could be a, a much bigger threat to the capitalist system uh, as, as the years go on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Think and finally, Laura Schiffleffer. Hello, Laura. Hi, Laura. Hi. <laughs> it's great to see you. It is great to see you. And I am so excited to actually be able to speak to you live for the first time. Yeah, ever. I'm, a big, I'm a big fan of yours, too. Boy, some of my heroes are right here. <laughs> oh, well, that goes doubly, triply, and quadruply for me <laughs> to you because uh, your work has inspired me immeasurably. Well, that's very um, gratifying. Thank you. Um, so uh, I had also, I'm going to be cheeky and ask kind of a two part question, I guess. Um, so the first thing is I just want to kind of respond to um, this issue that keeps coming up of this question about, you know, how do we actually achieve uh, socialism or the end of capitalism? And do we go with kind of more of a statist approach or do we go more with a, a communalist approach that is kind of more going back to the um origins of, uh, you know, like you were saying, kind of like the, um, you know, the original communism, right? The um, ancient communism. Um, And so I wanted to uh, see if you're aware of and have any thoughts on, uh, number one, this communalist movement that is happening right now, where uh, there's really kind of like an effort being made to build a network of these sorts of independent communities that are uh, developing kind of more like mutual aid based systems of economies and uh, non hierarchical forms of organization and direct democracy um, and kind of, you know, achieve that by organizing that on the grassroots level and then kind of creating a, a sort of a dual power challenge for the existing capitalist and status structures. And specifically, um, if there is maybe potential for us to do that in a vegan way. So kind of having a vegan communalist network within the broader communalist system and sort of kind of try to influence the communalist movement uh, from the inside in that way. Uh, So that was um, my first question. And my second actually has to do with this issue of land usage uh, in animal exploitation, because I was actually working on a research project that was making me tear my hair out for many months because, uh, you know, I um, had this thesis that there was this huge issue of um, displacement that was currently happening 
um, you know, through these uh, corporate land grabs right. um, that was being driven by animal agribusiness. And yet when I tried to do the research on that, I was not coming up with anything. And, um, you know, there was, there was, of course, there's some of that going on in Latin America. We are hearing about that. But, you know, what I was hearing was this very strange paradox where um, animal consumption was rising and rising, and yet it did not seem like the land usage was rising and rising that would go along with that, logically, you would think. And so I was kind of really stumped for a long time. And what I found out is that actually um, at the turn of the millennium, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization um, of the UN came out and they issued this report where they said, well, you know, we can't keep expanding with land um, because, uh, you know, it's a climate issue and, um, you know, the population is growing and these economies are growing, you know, in these BRIC countries and whatnot, and they're going to demand more animal products, but we're not going to have the land to do it. And so therefore, we need to actually um, coerce the rest of the world to get into factory farming. And so in doing this, they're basically consolidating the industry um, where they're building all of these factory farms and slaughterhouses all over the world. And of course, that is allowing them to centrally control uh, the industry more and more and more. And it's it's actually what they did, um, you know, here in the U.S., uh, where I am, U.S. occupied Turtle Island. <laughs> um, that's that's what they did, is that they turned the farmers into contractors. And so instead of having these little small farmers, uh, now they're all, you know, contracted by these big conglomerates and they're, they're globalizing that. So I wanted to bring that up um, as obviously, you know, a, a very clear-cut case of, uh, you know, capitalism and animal exploitation and, you know, um, being very enmeshed. Um, but I, I wanted to see how you feel it would be helpful for us to then kind of respond to this when we talk about this land issue, because historically, obviously, um, you know, that was a huge issue and it still is in many ways, but I do feel like sometimes that can, they can co-opt that narrative they can say, oh, well, you know, you're right. We can't have all this land usage. So instead, the solution is to concentrate animal farming more. So, um, yeah, I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, yeah, regarding that, the first part of your question, yeah, I'm not so informed about these communalist movements. I, I have heard of that. Yeah, any information you can send me, I mean, that sounds very promising. And that's Amen. hopeful. Yeah, that sounds very promising, and and to the extent that that vegans in such a movement, you could also again be reaching out to other members of the left, right? You're trying to educate and inform. Uh, yeah, that sounds that sounds great. Yeah, so yeah, I'm looking forward to more information. You might send my way when you have a chance. Oh yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, yeah, the agribusiness. I mean, they'll drive they'll drive the world you know, absolutely you know, to to the end. Um, and make every penny they can, uh, you know, until until we have the the ultimate collapse. But and I've even read where in China they're actually they've got high rise factory farms now. I mean they're stacking animals you know, into these high rise complexes. Um, uh, you know, it's horrible. And of course they they've exploited and strong armed you know countries like the Philippines, Indonesia. And of course, this is horrible for other animals, and this is horrible for people there. You've got land uh, expropriation, and then of course, but these other animals, you know, they need. You know, they're going to continue to do land grabs, um, uh, do whatever modifications they can to keep in increasing the amount of um, uh, corn and soy and, and other feed that they need you know, for these oppressed other animals. Um, right here in Ohio, I mean, for years, I mean, everything is corn and soy. Everything is corn and soy because it continues to be, you know, subsidized in some way by the government. You know, like it used to be directly subsidized. And now I think maybe, um, uh, you know, their profits are guaranteed or if they suffer any losses, the government's going to bail them out. You know, this is all the power of the state and tangled oppression politically. But, oh, uh, yeah, it's horrible. And, and, and again, we know how destructive this is. We know how much this contributes to the climate crisis. And... And then you know the 
it's just the roulette wheel for the next deadly influenza pandemic with all these growing numbers. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's inevitable. It's just, you know, when will it come? How deadly is it going to be? And again, that's another form of entangled oppression. They don't care if they make profits. They don't care how many, how many billions and billions of other animals suffer. And they don't care about the pandemic as long as their profits for the next quarter continue to rise. That's capitalism, right? Capitalism is just driving the, the acquisition for, for material gain. Yeah, great questions. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I can't see it on my end. Could you read me one of the questions, Dennis? I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. What does David see as a solution to this, this seemingly doomed goal that's from Carl? Uh, the seemingly doomed goal doomed, of... Doomed goal. Um, I think it's when you were talking about that we'll continue to expand and, and um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so maybe that means the solution to our race toward the abyss. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is scary. And, and and to be quite candid, I mean, with all this power that the capitalists have, ideological, political, uh, economic power, uh, this is not an easy task, uh, which which makes it, I think, all the more all the more important that we realize that it's this this is a structural problem, it's a systemic problem, that people aren't exploiting animals because they've got some individual moral deficiencies or we just need to deal with their prejudice against other animals, that we realize that this is a structural problem that's deeply connected to all forms of oppression historically. And, and we need to begin promoting, supporting, you know, all challenges to the capitalist system and, and promoting uh, some form of alternative like socialism. That's our window out of this impending catastrophe. And it, it's a steep hill to climb, but that, but that is the only path to get there. So uh, it, it's a formidable obstacle, but that's, I mean, that's the path. You know, that's the race that we're on to try to get up that, that steep climb. It's a lot of work, but look what's at stake. Exactly. Uh, and one more finally from David or another part of us. There have been many attempts throughout history to establish a utopia, a society where all animals, inclusive of humans, are free with the push for justice and equitable equality. However, while many small scale projects were successful, they all seem doomed to fail with infighting and factions developing, especially as the society grew in size. So he's asking you, how, how, how is it going to work? Um, I, I think you know, most of these endeavors, I, I think they, uh, they're they trying to uh, trying to exist, you know, w within societies and within systems that are working against them from the get go. <laughs> so, so this, like I said, this is one of the reasons why uh, attempts at socialism and even communism around the world have been so difficult to achieve is because from the outside, there's always those trying to um, to bring them down. And but I, I do think that one of the things that we need to challenge, and this may take us back more squarely to ecofeminism, and we need to challenge capitalism, but we need to realize that that uh, toxic masculinity um, and capitalism are basically, you know, this, they're, I mean, they go hand in hand. And as long as we've got men who are raised and socialized and, and they've got with these values of domination and aggression and intimidation and it's my way i mean is i mean if we had feminists <laughs> i don't know if there's any examples of feminists trying to start these alternative societies and those that probably i would suspect have been somewhat more successful but i think we also at the same time we need to challenge the very nature of masculinity and the way that it exists today and the way that males are, are socialized and again uh, that just uh, goes hand in hand with uh, with the predation of the capitalist system. Uh, so uh, so I, I guess the short answer is, you know, when those societies are founded, they need to come up with, uh, they need to come up with agreements. And, and some of those agreements are mutual respect. Um, uh, you know, males can't dominate. <laughs> you know, we've got to lay some ground rules. And again, it's a hard way to go when you've got a, an outside community, you know, that's trying to bring you down uh, in various ways. Uh, yeah, masculinity, big problem. 
I think we're out of time. I suppose if people want to ask you a question, they can always contact you by email. Yeah, it's a D Nibert, D N I B E R T, at Wittenberg, W I T T E N B E R G dot E D U. Or if you just Google, you know, David Nibert, sociologist, you know, um, uh, uh, rabble rouser, <laughs> nonconformist, <laughs> you'll probably find me somewhere. Okay, I think so. I think so. We're, we're ready to do a wrap here. I want to thank everybody for coming and thank you very much, David. That was a, an intriguing talk. Um, we had high expectations and it, it exceeded that. And I think everybody is really happy with tonight. I am certainly. Thank you very much, David. Thank That's thank great. You. Very, thank you. Yeah, very thank kind, uh, Dennison. Thank you again for the invitation.